Have you ever wondered what does watermelon have to do with race? And what is so offensive about watermelon? Don't white people like watermelon too? Well, the stereotype of African Americans being excessively fond of watermelons came during a specific period in history and was used to fulfill a specific political purpose. After slaves won their emancipation, they made watermelon a symbol of their newfound freedom by growing, eating, and selling it. Southern whites responded by using the fruit to deplete African Americans as unclean, lazy, and childishness. This trope was so widely accepted within popular culture that the origins of it are almost forgotten. The trope of the racist watermelon didn't emerge until after emancipation. In the early 1900s, the European imagination associated the typical watermelon eater with Italians or Arabs. A British officer stationed in Egypt in 1808 described the watermelon as a poor Arab feast, noting that the locals ate them ravenously as if the passersby was going to snatch them away. Watermelon rhymes were apparently a common sight on the streets of the port city of Rosetta. In Egypt, watermelon was also associated with uncleanliness, laziness, and childishness. These associations eventually made their way to America, but watermelon hadn't yet been connected to African Americans. In fact, at that time, Americans were just as likely to associate watermelons with white Kentucky hillbillies or New Hampshire yokels as they would a black South Carolina enslaved person. During child slavery, some plantation owners would allow their slaves to cultivate and even sell their own watermelons. Sometimes they would even give them a day off during the summer to enjoy their first watermelon harvest. Southern plantation owners viewed this slave's delight in watermelon as an indication of their own supposed compassion. Slaves were also careful to relish watermelon in a manner that followed the code of conduct established by whites. As a result, whites could expect slaves to act in a manner of a caricature of a watermelon craving, juice dripping, picking any. Refusing to comply with this stereotype could jeopardize the precarious relationship between master and enslaved. The abolishment of enslavement drastically altered the relationship between black people and whites. Formerly enslaved individuals avoided sharecropping on white-owned plantations by growing, consuming, and selling their own watermelons. This behavior of enjoying your freedom and cultivating your own land and selling watermelon in public markets provoked a major fear within the white community. Newspapers would then stoke this fear that whites have and strengthen the idea of African Americans having an affinity for watermelons. In 1869, Frank Leslie's illustrated paper published a cartoon of an African American eating a watermelon. The accompanying article stated that Southern African Americans have a strong liking for watermelon. They thoroughly enjoy eating it. Two years later, a Georgia newspaper reported the arrest of a black man for allegedly poisoning a watermelon with the intention of killing his neighbor. The article compared the man's actions to that of the Ku Klux Klan and asked if the Republican Congressional Subcommittee investigating the Klan should look into this incident in particular. The article also described the man as walking to the courthouse carrying an enormous watermelon. Medical journals also wrote with a scientific earnest about black patients. They claimed that their intestines were clogged with watermelons. In an 1888 report by Dr. D.Z. Holliday of Harlem, Georgia, describing how he broke down a bowel instruction of an African-American man. He claimed that the mass was filled with 820 seeds, all of which the man had ingested in one night. Also, during the 1880 election season, Democrats accused South Carolina state legislature, which was majority black during Reconstruction, of having wasted the taxpayers' money on watermelons for their own enjoyment. In 1915, the white supremacist film D.W. Griffith, A Birth of a Nation, included a watermelon feast as a depiction of the emancipation as corrupt northern whites encouraged former enslaved people to stop working and enjoy watermelons instead. This idea of implicating black appetites and black character through the watermelon with the primary message being that African Americans were not ready for their own freedom and that stereotype of associating blacks with watermelon remains a common occurrence in the United States even today. For example, in 1947, when Jackie Robinson broke Major League Baseball's color barrier, he was confronted by race-baiting taunts including crowds throwing garbage, tomatoes, and watermelon rise at him. Even in 1989, blacks protesting the killing of a black boy in Bensonhurst, New York, were taunted by whites, some of them holding watermelons 
over their heads and screaming at them to go home. There are literally hundreds of instances over the years with a watermelon in association with African Americans being used as a tool of insult. Even decades after the end of the Jim Crow era, this cultural symbol of blacks and watermelon continues. Although fried chicken evolved independently across many different countries, fried chicken is a distinctly American invention. The origins of fried chicken can be traced back to enslaved Africans who brought together Scottish techniques of deep frying chicken with fat and seasoning techniques from Western African cooking. One of the earliest recipes of fried chicken came from the British cookbook in 1747 called The Art of Cookery Made Plain and Easy by Hannah Glass. The recipe, which was a hit in Britain and the colonies, particularly in the southern states, called for the butchering of pieces of chicken to be floured, then fried, and hulled. While there's not a lot of strong evidence that fried chicken is from Western Africa or it was invented then brought over in the transatlantic slave trade, West Africans did have a history of cooking chicken. They typically would use a method of braising their chicken. This is most likely the slave population that became linked to fried chicken because they were already familiar with cooking chicken and because the prevalence of poultry here in the United States. This is where the history of chicken takes a racist turn in the early 19th century. Fried chicken then became linked to Southern states and Southern started to link it to racist stereotypes connected to African-Americans. They depicted them as poultry thieves and ravenous eaters of fried chicken. And you start to see the popular stereotypes used in the connection of African-Americans eating certain foods, reinforcing the idea that African-Americans were not intellectual. Two of the most popular images used in terms of food was fried chicken and watermelon. Ironically, Plenty of white people love these same foods, but for whatever reason, the idea and the negative stereotypes associating these foods with African Americans, and it still exists today. The irony of it is, is that before the 20th century, fried chicken was seen as a luxury item only eaten on special occasions. Although the recipe is extremely simple, not everyone has the right kitchen tools or the access to poultry to make it at home until dramatic improvements in poultry farming in the early 20th century. As the United States began to flex its military muscle at the beginning of the 20th century, black GIs taught the world about delicacies of American barbecue, chitlins, and fried chicken. Motivated to settle overseas because of the enduring racism of the United States and the relative social acceptance of African Americans in other countries, many former servicemen opened up restaurants and shared their beloved recipes and turned regional soul food into a global phenomenon. The global spread of soul food really took off after the end of World War II. Recently discharged black military veterans in the European theater stayed overseas and opened and operated restaurants. At first, they mainly cooked for African Americans who were on active duty, but these these home style meals also found patrons from an unexpected source, foreign foodies. Europe was not the only place where soul food thrived. African American veterans stayed behind to open restaurants in Asia. After serving Korea and Vietnam, these countries became well known for soul food restaurants with a patronage of both African Americans and Native Asians. American soldiers were stationed in South Korea during the Korean War, introduced the concept of frying and battering chicken as a substitute for turkey on Thanksgiving. This was likely the first introduction of the food to the Korean people who were primarily steaming chicken or eating it in stews. However, it would not be for decades after the end of the Korean War that American style fried chicken took off in Korea. During the 60s, the first ever rotisserie chicken shop opened up in Korea, along with the invention of the yellow bag chicken. Salarymen would bring home yellow bag chicken, which was a whole rotisserie chicken in a bag and give it to their families. At the time, chicken was deal not widely consumed in Korea, thus the price was considerably expensive. Chicken became viewed as a luxury item that all families looked forward to eating once in a while. The reputation and popularity began to skyrocket. It was this nostalgia that helped fuel the boom of the coming fried chicken movement. Then, two changes occurred during the 70s. Cheap cooking oil became widely available and fried chicken became more affordable. This made it possible for families to prepare their own fried chicken, season it, coat it in flour before dunking the entire bird in hot oil. Fried chicken then went mainstream in 1977 with the opening of Lem's Fried Chicken in the basement of Seoul's Sinsky department store. The owner of Lem's Fried Chicken had traveled to the United States in 1975 for university and saw how KFC sold its fried chicken in pieces. He began experimenting and creating his own ginseng chicken and selling his creation in a six-piece set. 
Lim's Fried Chicken became the first fried chicken franchise in South Korea, and the appetite for the dish only grew larger as KFC entered the market in 1984. As of February of 2022, there were a staggering 87,000 Korean fried chicken joints in South Korea. In an ironic twist, the phenomenon has gone full circle as Korean fried chicken stores now open up restaurants here in the United States. John Pemberton, an Atlanta pharmacist and the inventor of Coke. This product was actually his second drink though. Prior to Coca-Cola, in 1884, Pemberton created a French wine cola. This drink was a copy of a popular French wine that contained cocaine. However, just as the product was gaining popularity, Atlanta made a decision to outlaw alcohol sales in November of 1885. In the United States, prohibition was often used as a tool to control minorities, particularly European Catholics and African Americans. Law enforcement officers used prohibition against intoxication to justify detaining members of black communities, especially in the South. This led to, in 1886, John Pemberton creating a temperance drink with reported medicinal effects. He named it Coca-Cola. This drink became popular and it was seen as a socially acceptable alternative to drinking alcohol in bars. Coca-Cola quickly became embraced as an intellectual beverage of well-off whites. Eliminating alcohol was only a temporary solution. As a solid G. Chandler, who had taken over the business, kept the formula a secret. However, as an Atlanta newspaper would reveal in 1891, what consumers already knew, Coca-Cola contained cocaine. Chandler began marketing the drink as refreshing rather than medicinal and managed to survive the controversy. But concerns erupted again after the company began distributing distinctive glass bottles in 1899, making it easily accessible to people of all races. Middle class whites worried that the soft drink was contributing to the rise of cocaine use among African Americans. Southern newspapers reported Negro coke fiends were raping white women and the police were seemingly powerless to stop them. By 1903, Chandler responded to these white fears and a wave of anti narcotics legislation by removing cocaine and adding sugar and caffeine. Coca Cola's recipe was not the only thing influenced by racism. During the 1920s and 30s, Coca-Cola was heavily influenced by white supremacy and this manifested itself in their lack of targeting of black consumers. Coca-Cola would go as far as introducing double-sided vending machines, one side for black Americans and another side for white Americans. Meanwhile, Pepsi was the second largest drink company in the country and attempting to compete with Coca-Cola by offering a sweeter product in a larger bottle for the same price. Despite their best efforts, they still trailed behind Coca-Cola into the 1940s. To gain a competitive edge, Pepsi CEO Walter S. Mack hired a team of African Americans to create a Negro markets department aimed at marketing to African Americans. Into the late 1940s, Pepsi began a marketing campaign targeted at African American consumers in the Southern Black Belt and in Northern urban areas. They hired Duke Ellington as a spokesperson, ran ads in black publications, and set up special point-to-purchase displays in stores frequented by African Americans. However, as a result, some Americans began to associate Pepsi with black people and Pepsi quickly killed the program. However, this image of Coke and Pepsi as white and black drinks continued to persist. It was not long after this that Coke sought to shake their whites only drink tag and began marketing to African Americans. They also began to support African American organizations and developed a relationship with the NAACP. It took some time, but the new tactic worked. And today, racial lines between soda companies, even in the South, is just a distant memory. Soft drink companies are now on good terms with one of their largest demographic markets, African Americans. Prior to the state's admittance into the Union in 1859, Oregon fashioned itself as a white utopia. When it became a state, it was only one that explicitly forbid certain races from occupying, laboring, and possessing land within its boundaries. Although these laws were revoked, they were generally effective in preventing black people from inhabiting Oregon in its formidable years, and consequently, Oregon would develop into a primarily white state in the 1840s and 50s. White settlers who came to the Oregon Territory were largely against slavery, yet many of them were against living in close proximity to black people. 
This was particularly due to fears that they would be used as competitors. As settlers were largely non-slaveholding farmers from places like Missouri and other border states that had already had difficulty competing against those that owned slaves. Furthermore, they were concerned that African Americans would conspire with native tribes and threaten their increasing settlement of that land. Despite this, a relative small number of black people did settle in Oregon during this time period, and a few immigrants from other states brought slaves with them, taking advantage of the lack of enforcement of anti-slavery laws in the area. In 1843, Oregon's small white population voted to incorporate the 1787 Northwestern Ordinance provision into its 1843 organic laws prohibiting slavery and voluntary servitude in the territories unless the person had been convicted of a crime. The law was amended in 1844 and gave slave owners a limited amount of time to either remove their slaves or set them free if they refused to take action. According to Peter Burnett's Lash Law, those that failed to obey this order would be publicly flogged with no less than 20 and no more than 39 stripes. Peter Burnett stated that the purpose of this law was to keep clear of the most troublesome class of the population, black people. He believed that Oregon was in a unique position to avoid the same struggles with African Americans that the rest of the United States and other countries had endured. But because the lashing penalty was judged to be unduly harsh, it was rescinded by voters in 1845 before anyone could be actually punished. September 21st. 1849, the Territorial Legislator of Oregon passed the second exclusionary law, which prohibited any black American from entering or residing in Oregon, with the exception of individuals who were already present in the territory. This legislation was prompted by fear that African Americans would spread ideas of hostility among the native population towards white people. It was also abolished in 1854. November 7, 1857, delegates of Oregon's Constitutional Convention presented a proposal to legalize slavery and exclusionary clause to its voters. The proposal to legalize slavery was overwhelmingly rejected, confirming Oregon's status as a free state. However, the exclusionary clause was agreed upon by a wide margin. It would be included in their Bill of Rights. This clause prohibited black individuals from entering the state of Oregon, owning property, or making contracts. As a result, Oregon became the only state to join the union with an exclusionary clause in its constitution barring black people from living and working within the state. Later, several attempts were made by the Oregon legislature to pass some type of enforcement law for the exclusionary policies of African Americans in their state. In 1865, legislature would reject a proposal for a county-by-county -county census of blacks that would authorize county sheriffs to deport African Americans from their state. This was followed by the Senate Committee killing off the final attempt of legislative enforcement in 1866. The clause would end up being rendered mute by the 14th Amendment of the United States Constitution, but it was not repealed by voters until 1926. These exclusionary laws, although generally not enforced, had a chilling effect on African Americans coming into the state. In 1860, the census reported that only 128 African Americans out of a total population of 52,000 lived in Oregon. According to estimates in the United States Census in 2019, the Oregon population is nearly 87% white, with the state black population only occupying 2%. Every year, American enjoys the traditional feast known as Thanksgiving, and during this time, pumpkin and sweet potato pies sales spike. But did you know the history behind these beloved desserts and their connection to Northern abolitionists, Thanksgiving, and the holiday season as a whole? See, Thanksgiving pumpkin pie was once the hotly contested battleground in America's cultural war. In the 1800s, pumpkins and sweet potatoes became a totem in the fight to abolish slavery in America. The introduction of sweet potatoes to Western Africa in the 16th century was a very slow process. Initially, root vegetables such as cassava and yams were preferred over sweet potatoes. However, after the transatlantic slave trade, which helped spread the popularity of sweet potatoes in Europe and the Americas, it was only then that the African-American community started using sweet potatoes because of their convenience. Western Africa is a yam-based culture. 
wild sweet potatoes are not the same thing as a tropical yam. Enslaved people embraced them as a substitute in the absence of true yams. Before they had sweet potato pie, they had something called sweet potato pound, which is a corruption of the Native American word for baked bread. Enslaved people were eating roasted sweet potatoes cooked in the embers of fire and started spicing and mashing up sweet potatoes. As they got access to cooking technology and equipment like ovens, they started adding pie fillings and the sweet potato pie was born. After slavery was abolished, African Americans began to migrate away from the southern United States in what was referred to as the Great Migration. During this time period, many African Americans brought along one of their favorite dishes, sweet potato pie, and it was introduced to other regions of the country. During the same time period, during the early 19th century, eating pumpkins and celebrating Thanksgiving became synonymous with identity politics. Abolitionist and pumpkin enthusiast and home economics pioneer Sarah Joseph Hale was the driving force behind the pro-Thanksgiving campaign. Hale campaigned for state-level Thanksgiving celebrations and was largely successful in the early 1800s, helping spur declarations for Thanksgiving in 29 states by 1850. But as the fight over slavery intensified and the Civil War loomed, people in the southern states began to reject what they saw as northern cultural aggressions. The state of Virginia in particular wanted no part of Thanksgiving. In a letter to Hale, Virginia Governor Henry Wise, who was strongly pro-slavery, expressed his disapproval of New England abolitionist goals by referring to the theatrical national claptrap of Thanksgiving, which he said was used to encourage ministers to preach Christianity politics. Still, in 1863, Abraham Lincoln would declare the last Thursday in November as the National Day of Thanksgiving. Lincoln hoped that this holiday would serve in some way to heal the wounds of the nation and restore it. And since then, every president has kept that tradition alive. Still, some members of the Confederacy were unhappy with the Thanksgiving celebration and perceived it as a political move. They were especially unhappy with what they saw as a New Englander attempting to dictate how they should live. So for many years after the Civil War, Southerners refused to celebrate Thanksgiving and refused to eat pumpkin pie. It was not until after Reconstruction that Southern states began to accept Thanksgiving, and it wasn't until 1941 that Thanksgiving holiday was officially recognized in the federal law. So in the absence of pumpkin pie, Southerners started cooking sweet potato pie made by formerly enslaved people. Pumpkin pie, despite its popularity, remained a Yankee food for many generations. It didn't gain widespread recognition across the South until the 20th century when television and supermarkets began to promote mass market pumpkin pie filling. A story about how Charlie for Willy Wonka in the Chocolate Factory was originally a little black child. On the surface, it would seem that the story of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory was about good and bad children in the same vein of maybe Santa Claus with the likable Charlie Bucket winning it all at the end. It's a classic rags to riches story that is as American as apple pie. But the story takes on a different tone when you realize the original Charlie was black. In an interview with BBC Radio in 2017, Lindsay Dahl said that the first Charlie that he wrote was a little black boy. And when asked why it was changed, she replied that I don't know, but it's a great pity. But Rondo Dahl's biographer, Donald Sterlock, during another interview stated that the change to a white character was driven by Dahl's agent, who thought that a black Charlie would not appeal to readers. He would state that, I can't tell you that the agent thought it was a bad idea, but when the book was first published, with a black hero, she asked Ronald Dahl why. Now, Ronald Dahl was not a saint. He was a self-admitted bigot, especially against Jewish people. In his first publication of the book, the Oompa Loompas were described as pygmies from Africa. He would describe them himself as hardworking but mischievous African pygmies. When the film adaptation was announced, it drew the attention of the NAACP, who expressed concerns about the transportation of Oompa Loompas from Africa to Wonka's factory would look a lot like slavery. Rondell Dahl seemed to sympathize with the NAACP's concerns and published a revised version. In this edition, as well as all subsequent sequels, the Oompa Loompas were drawn as orange tinted with green hair and all references to Africa was deleted. Thank you. I'm your host, Country Boy, and this has been One Mike History. I'm going to continue. 
Did you know that before there was Central Park, there was the primarily African-American community of Seneca Village? 1825, white farmers John and Elizabeth Whitehead divided up their land into 200 parcels and sold them. Andrew Williams, a 25-year-old African-American shoe shiner, purchased the first three lots for $125. Epiphany Davis, a store clerk, bought 12 lots for $578. Additionally, an African-American Methodist Episcopal Zion Church purchased six lots. This marked the beginning of Seneca Village, an African-American community that grew quickly over the next few years. By 1832, there were roughly 10 homes in the village with the Whitehead selling off half of their parcels to other African-Americans. During the Great Famine in Ireland in the mid-1800s, Seneca Village's population grew by 30 percent, largely comprised of Irish immigrants. Despite the social and racial conflict elsewhere in the city between the two groups, Irish and African-Americans lived in Seneca Village in close proximity to one another. For African-Americans in Seneca Village, it was a place of refuge from the discrimination and overcrowded conditions in New York City. Compared to other African-Americans living in the city, the residents of Seneca Village were more stable and prosperous. By 1855, about half of the village inhabitants owned their own homes, giving them a level of security and rights not shared by most African-Americans within the city. One of the rights was the right to vote, which was granted to them upon meeting New York State by 1821 requirements of owning at least $250 worth of property and holding residency there for at least three years. Of the 100 black voters in New York City that were eligible to vote in 1845, 10 of them were residents in Seneca Village. During that same time in the early 1800s, New York City's population saw a rapid expansion. As the city's noise and chaos grew, its citizens increasingly sought ways to escape the city's chaos. At the time, most of the city's green spaces were cemeteries, which were seeing large crowds of people who wanted to spend their spare time closer to nature by walking, picnicking, and other outdoor activities. Additionally, affluent New Yorkers advocated for the establishment of a grand park within the city. During the 1850s, the city of New York started a plan for a large public park as a response to the unhealthy environment of the city and as a source for recreational activities. As a result, the New York State Legislature passed a law in 1853 reserving 750 acres of land from 59th Street to 106th Street and from 5th Avenue all the way to 8th Avenue, making it the first major landscaped public park in the United States. As construction of Central Park grew near to Seneca Village, the newspapers and politicians began to characterize Seneca Village as a shanty town and called the inhabitants, then citizens, squatters, vagabonds, and scoundrels. The citizens of Seneca Village worked to protect their homes and the community, yet in 1857, the city used their power of eminent domain to evict them. This law allows the government to take property for public use from the landowner after receiving financial compensation. Police officers were sent to forcibly remove the individuals who refused to leave. This removal resulted in the displacement of over 1,600 individuals who had previously lived in the area. Despite offering compensation, many of the affected people argued that the amount they received was wholly inadequate. By the end of 1857, all of the residents had been forced to move, and today research is being done into where the inhabitants of Seneca Village was relocated to. Some evidence suggests that they may have gone to other African-American communities, such as the Sandy Ground in Staten Island or Skunk Hollow in New Jersey. The second story tonight is about Bruce's Beach and how the city of Manhattan Beach used eminent domain to remove a black community. Are you familiar with the story of Bruce's Beach? In 1912 and 1920, Charles and Willa Bruce purchased two lots of land along a strand of Manhattan Beach for $1,200. Like many African Americans, the Bruce's family had moved west during the Great Migration to seek better opportunities and to participate in the promise of California and the American dream. Shortly after purchasing the land, the Bruce's turned location into a seaside resort called Bruce's Lodge that welcomed black beachgoers from all over Los Angeles and the area became known as Bruce's Beach. That Manhattan Beach area, though, 
was a predominantly white community. And as the Los Angeles population increased, the property values soared going into the 1920s. Many white residents of the surrounding community reacted with hostility and racism. Meanwhile, the resort gained popularity amongst black beachgoers and other families purchased land and lots near Bruce's Beach. Some built vacation homes and established the beginning of a modest, diverse community on Manhattan Beach. However, in 1924, prompted by a petition from local white residents, Manhattan Beach City Council voted to condemn Bruce's Beach's site and use eminent domain to acquire the surrounding properties, including some of the black owned businesses to build a park. Eminent domain is the government or an agent's right to private property for public use with payment or compensation. The couple was sued for $120,000, which included $35,000 for each lot and $50,000 in damages. In 1929, they settled for $14,500. It's well documented that the reason behind the eminent domain process was racially motivated with the intent to bring an end to the successful business and thwart any other African Americans from settling or developing in Manhattan Beach. City ordinances were passed to prohibit resort type businesses in the area and effectively prohibited Bruce and other black families from purchasing additional beachfront properties in the area. Also, also passed prohibit dressing and undressing in vehicles on the street, public places or in tents, and parking restrictions were implemented to harass and prohibit African American visitation to Bruce's Beach's shoreline area. Afterwards, the Bruce family was left destitute by the land seizure and was forced to move out of Manhattan Beach area in 1927. They then moved to East LA where they spent the rest of their lives working as cooks and local diners. The city immediately demolished Bruce's Beach Resort and the land would sit empty for decades. The city of Manhattan Beach didn't build a park until 1956, almost 30 years later. Over the years, the park was called by many different names. It wasn't until Manhattan Beach, first black councilman and mayor Mitch Ward, along with other local citizens, led to renaming effort of Bruce's Beach in 2007. Through a series of land transfers through the city of Manhattan Beach to the state of California to the county of Los Angeles, L.A. County acquired the land in 1995. But in 2001, the county began the process of returning ownership to the descendants of the Bruce's. On April 20th, 2021, L.A. Council Supervisors unanimously voted to approve the returning of county land to the family's descendants. However, due to the series of land transfers, a restriction required Los Angeles County to use Bruce's Beach for public recreation and prevented the county from transferring or selling the property without state legislation. On June 2nd, 2021, the California State Senate approved a bill allowing for the return of the property to Bruce's descendants. January 2023, the family of the Bruce's informed the county of L.A. of their decision to sell Bruce's Beach back to L.A. County for $20 million. And the final story tonight is about the Mill Creek Valley and how the city of St. Louis used urban renewal to remove 20,000 African Americans from their community and to build the Gateway Arch. Have you ever heard the story of the Gateway Arch and the black community of Mill Creek? Now, the Greenway Arch is the nation's tallest national monument. It stands at 630 feet and is crafted from 800 tons of stainless steel. The arch is a feat of precision engineering with two legs that join in the middle with the accuracy of 1 60th of an inch. And you would expect with a project like this, there will be some racism involved. 1910, African Americans moved from southern states and began the Great Migration to the neighborhood that would become the Mill Creek Valley. By the 1920s, the area had become a hub for an African American community and the working middle class. It became one of the largest African American communities in the nation in the first half of the 20th century, spanning 400 acres and homes to hundreds of businesses, organizations, 5,500 residential buildings by the 1950s. But the legacy of redlining and segregation had devastating effects on the neighborhood. Many of the buildings lacked water and electricity, and by the middle of the 20th century, it had become one of the least desirable places to live within the city. 1934, local business leaders promoted the idea of a memorial to Thomas Jefferson and his expansionary vision of the Louisiana Purchase. But their real aim was to get rid of the city's waterfront blighted property and bring in federal construction dollars. 
following a controversial bond measure that passed that allowed for the demolition of 40 blocks of Riverside property that included 400 businesses, the Post-Dispatch announced that the project was election thievery, and the Interior Secretary Harold Ix objected to it, stating that it was speculative real estate. However, World War II would disrupt public works projects, and money wouldn't begin flowing until Harry Truman was elected president. Still, the area was left in disarray for more than a decade until the interstate system of highways was approved by Dwight Eisenhower. This included a stretch that passed along a site and renewed appeal for a project of an outsized attraction for many Americans to see as they passed by in their cars. As plans to develop the Gateway Arch emerged in the 30s, so did plans for a low-rent subsidized housing. The Housing Act of 1954 was enacted to fund urban renewal projects across the country. August 7, 1954, Mayor Raymond Tucker announced his plan to demolish existing structures to make way for new development. In 1955, St. Louis voters approved a $110 million bond issue with $100 million designated solely for the destruction of the black community of Mill Creek Valley. The urban renewal project included construction of residential buildings, the creation of industrial zones, the building of new highways that included the building of U.S. Highway 40. It was the most expensive urban renewal project in the nation at the time, and ultimately 20,000 African-Americans were displaced in order to make room for this urban renewal project that began in 1955. Then the highway system continued to cause damage to the African-American population of St. Louis because they were cut off from the development that was taking place around the Gateway Arch and racial tensions were already heightened because construction unions had barred African-Americans from working on the site. During the 60s, subsidized housing was developed in the Mill Creek Valley with some success. But by the late 70s, the area had not lived up to developers' expectations. As of now, much of the Mill Creek Valley neighborhood consists of vacant lots. Have you ever wondered why black people love cognac so much? Ironically, while cognac originates in France, French people rarely consume it themselves. Instead, they export almost 97% of their product to the United States, who is their largest single consumer. African Americans comprise a large majority of those sales, signifying a decades-long tradition between African American consumers and cognac that dates all the way back to the 19th century. Origins of cognac, though can be traced back to the 16th century in the southwest region of France. It is during this time that Dutch sailors discovered that they needed a way to transport wine during long journeys. They purchased French wine and endeavored to keep it drinkable for the entire voyage. Thus, this led to distillation. The product was then named brandy wine or burnt wine, which would later be called simply brandy. By the 18th, 19th centuries, burnt wine was being exported to England, Holland, Asia and the Americas. During the First World War, more than 380,000 African Americans served in the army, with 200,000 of them being sent to Europe. 21 years later, more than a million African American men and women of all branches of the United States Armed Forces served in World War II. Many black soldiers were stationed in southwestern France, which is believed to be African Americans' first encounter with cognac. Furthermore, the connection between cognac producers and black consumers is likely strengthened by the presence of black artists and musicians such as Josephine Baker who performed jazz and blues in Paris clubs during that interwar period. Cognac's popularity with African Americans was likely due to its representation in a country which celebrated black culture rather than marginalizing it. Even after the soldiers returned home, the love of cognac continued in the Americas. The main liquor of choice was whiskey. This was a drink that was often named after Confederate leaders, sending a message of exclusion. In light of this, it's no surprise that African Americans sought an alternative to the drink. In the post-World War II era, cognac producers placed increased emphasis on the American markets due to the emergence of scotch as a rival on French shelves. To overcome this competition, cognac producers began targeting the African-American demographic who developed a taste for the spirit. Hennessy, in particular, placed advertisements in black publications, a decision that was extremely rare during the time. Hennessy featured ads in Ebony and in Jet with black models early in 1951 and depicted some of the more positive aspects of African-American life. By the 1990s, though, Cognac had acquired its image of being favored by an older crowd. Its popularity began to decline. However, references to Cognac by rap artists and rap songs would change this image of an older crowd. 
The release of Buster's Pastor Cavassier in 2001 caused a 30% surge in Cavassier sales. Collaborations with rappers and other cognac brands also increased the overall cognac sales in the United States by a similar percentage. In response, the four major cognac brands, Cavassier, Hennessy, Martel, and Remy Martin, have studied the U.S. market closely and tailored their products accordingly. For example, Cavassier discovered that Americans were buying cognac and Moscato wine separately at liquor stores and mixing them together so they would release a pre-mixed product to save customers a step. Today, while the United States is the largest consumer of cognac, it's believed that the African-American community accounts for somewhere to 60 to 80 percent of sales of cognac in the United States. Next up in this episode, we're going to talk about the history of the word woke. Have you ever wondered where the word woke comes from and how it became such a politically divisive term? Before woke evolved into an all-encompassing term to describe left political ideology or for shorthand for people on the left in general, or even worse, weaponized as a soft N-word. But before 2014, the phrase woke and stay woke was simply a call for African Americans to be on the lookout or be careful in a system that was created to be unjust. The concept of wokeness can be traced back to the early 20th century in a call to action by Jamaican philosopher and social activist Marcus Garvey. In 1923, Marcus Garvey called for global black citizens to wake up Ethiopia, to wake up Africa. This call to action aimed to foster social and political awareness and one of the earliest known examples of wokeness as an idea of black consciousness waking itself up. A few years later, 1938, the phrase stay woke turned up in a song about the Scottsboro Boys, a protest song by blues musician Judy Ledbetter, a.k.a. Leadbelly. The song chronicles the unjust trial and conviction of nine black African-American teenagers in Scottsboro, Alabama in 1931 who were wrongfully accused of raping two white women. Leadbelly said that he met the Scottsboro defendant's lawyer and introduced him to the men himself. When I made this little song down there, Leadbelly says, I also advised everybody to be a little careful when they go down there and it's best to stay woke and keep your eyes open. Leadbelly uses the phrase stay woke as a symbol of African Americans need to stay aware of the dangers of white America and the racial motivations that they face. This use became the most common and most consistent use of the phrase ever since. 1962, the New York Times published an article by black novelist William Melvin Kelly entitled, If You Woke, You Dig It, No Mickey Mouse Can Be Expected to Follow Today's Negro Idiom Without Hip Assist. Kelly's piece discussed the origins of the big knit culture and language, such words like cool and dig, and highlighted the fact that these terms did not originate with white America, but with black jazz musicians. He argued that to understand language in this culture, one needed a hip assist from African American culture. Kelly's article discusses the ever-changing nature of black American vernacular and the importance of preserving it from exploitation or alteration by white people. Given that this is the earliest mainstream reference of the term woke is an opinion piece that warned against the habit of white Americans appropriating black vernacular. In a way, it seems that the word even predicted its own fate. Today, of course, the word woke and its derivatives, such as politically correct, social justice warrior, cancel culture, have been adopted by conservative groups to insult people on the left. The phrases have become so negatively charged, they've been labeled as skunk terms. This has led to people abandoning their use as the malicious intent of those words have made them so unpleasant that they can't be employed in their original context. From 1877 to 1960, the Democratic Party held a virtually unchallenged grip on the politics of the South in a period known as the Solid South. This control would begin to loosen as the Democratic Party would gradually shift its position on black civil rights. 1964 to 1994, the South underwent a gradual transition from the Democratic Party to a Republican stronghold. Democrats and Republicans in the past were not as ideologically unified as they appear today. There was a time when there were conservative Democrats, especially in the South, and liberal Republicans. During the 1930s, Franklin Roosevelt created the New Deal Coalition in its efforts to combat the Great Depression, unifying labor unions, rural Southerners, and different minority groups under a collective force to support his agenda. 
His administration even recruited some liberal Republicans to that coalition, resulting in the formation of the Black Cabinet, which was a group of black leaders who served as policy advisors to the president. Simultaneously, a conservative coalition emerged, consisting of conservative Democrats, especially in the South, and some conservative Republicans. These two coalitions remained active into the 1960s, prompting some Southern Democrats to switch over to the Republican Party. This dynamic led to a more progressive Democratic establishment in conflict with the conservative Southern voting bloc in matters such as race and social welfare. After the 1948 presidential election, President Harry Truman made an explicit appeal to new civil rights measures before Congress, including voting rights protections, a federal ban on lynching, and bolstering civil rights laws. Because of this, he faced a break from Southern Democrats who formed a state's right Democratic Party under Southern Governor Strom Thurmond. Strom Thurmond's ticket won almost a million votes and 39 electoral votes taking Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and South Carolina. Nonetheless, Harry Truman was successful in winning the election with 77% of the black vote and the number of African Americans identifying as Democrats would progressively increase. This surge of black solidarity for the Democratic Party led to an electoral advantage for the party and the implementation of racially progressive policies. This shift caused white segregationists to consider a third party presidential bid, indicating they were searching for a new political home. This exhibited some of the first major weakenings of the Solid South. And in the 1952 and 1956 election, Dwight Eisenhower's GOP began to make further inroads into the South. Southern Democrats were instrumental in the segregationist movement opposing black civil rights during this period. Virginia Governor Harry Byrd established a massive resistance campaign to combat school desegregation, and 99 Southern Democrats endorsed the Declaration of Constitutional Principles that was the Southern Manifesto, an objection to desegregation initiative. Strom Thurmond ran an individual filibuster of the 1957 Civil Rights Act, which lasted over 24 hours, and notable segregationist figures such as George Wallace of Alabama and Ross Barnett were both Southern governors. During the 1960 election, Richard Nixon and John F. Kennedy had similar perspectives on civil rights. Nixon garnered almost a third of the African-American vote, but it's important to realize that majority of African-Americans resided in the South where they could not exercise their right to vote. Also during the 1960 election, frustrated Southern electors from 14 states that had cast their ballots for John F. Kennedy during the presidential election declined to cast their vote for him, instead voting for Harry Byrd, who wasn't even a candidate. This election marked the last time a presidential candidate was able to receive more than 15 percent of the African-American vote. In 1968, the presidential election saw another major shift into the South as the region continued to abandon the Democratic Party. Only Texas, the home state of Democratic nominee Hubert Humphrey, voted for him in this election. George Wallace, running on a campaign of only white supremacy for the American Independent Party, was successful in gaining 10 million votes and 46 electoral votes in five southern states. Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama, and Georgia. After 1968, the South would continue to support Republican candidates, voting for Richard Nixon in 1972, Ronald Reagan in 1980 and 1984, and Bush in 1988. Meanwhile, African Americans were already heavily voting for Democrats. At no point after 1936 did a Republican candidate get more than 45% of the black vote. The GOP would then employ the Southern strategy to capitalize on racial tensions and gain a crucial foothold in the South. This strategy, developed by political strategist Kevin Phillips and implemented in Richard Nixon's election campaign in 1968 and 1972. See, in 1965, the enfranchisement of black voters in the South and the strong support of the Democratic Party caused conservative white Southerners to lean even further towards the Republican Party. Additionally, the party began to use coded language such as law and order and states' rights to target conservative white Southerners who were resentful of the racial integration and fearful of urban unrest. Despite this, many Southern Democrats still won state and congressional elections, most significantly less dramatic election for governor in Georgia in 1966. However, the progressive and multiracial Democratic Party establishment, coupled with the successes of Richard Nixon and Ronald Reagan's administration, gradually moved conservative politicians in the South, more towards the Republican Party. This all culminated in the Republican Revolution in 1994 when the South became a firmly Republican region.
Meanwhile, the Democratic Party strengthened its bond with the black voters, leading to groundbreaking establishments such as the election of Douglas Wilder as the first black governor in the United States. Even Jesse Jackson's two unsuccessful presidential campaigns in 1984 and 1988 were instrumental in producing the necessary amendments to the Democratic Party's platform, further increasing the number of black representatives, mayors, and other elected officials. As a result of all of this, Identity politics has now become fully entangled with partisanship. The Republican Party is now attracting more white voters than ever, while black voters have become increasingly connected to the Democratic Party. What if I told you the story about how these two actually became friends? Well, in September 4th, 1957. Nine black students were attempting to integrate Little Rock Central High School. They were known as the Little Rock Nine. One of those students was Elizabeth Eckford. Elizabeth Eckford at the time did not have a house phone, so she wasn't aware of the other eight students' plans to enter on the other side of the school with an escort of ministers. So she entered on the wrong side of the school and had to walk in alone. During that time, a group of white students surrounded her as she was walking in and began screaming, 2468 we don't want to integrate. One of those students being Hazel Bryant, who was reported as screaming at effort, go home, Negro, go back to Africa. After this happened, she received a lot of critical hate mail. Thus, her parents removed Hazel Bryant from the school. After this time, she felt guilty of her treatment of effort and had changed her mind on integration and attempted to apologize to her in 1964. They would not meet again until 1997, which commemorated the 40th anniversary of Central Little Rock High School's integration. During that time, they actually became friends. They would off, they would go do activities together and even did a few documentaries. This all ended in 1999 because as Elizabeth Eckford would put it, Hazel Bryant wanted her to be able to move on from her past and basically wanted to not be responsible for the incident that happened on that day. And Elizabeth Eckford simply couldn't put this behind her. Have you ever wondered why black people love Cadillacs? For African Americans, Cadillacs were not just a popular brand, but they became a symbol of success and pride. And as it turns out, Cadillacs didn't become a fan favorite of African Americans by accident. During the beginning of the 20th century, cars began to enter the American landscape. During that period, car makers started to pop up all over the place. In 1903 alone, 57 companies were established, but shortly thereafter, 27 of them went bankrupt. Cadillac, though, is one of the oldest and longest surviving brands in automotive history, having entered the market as General Motors' luxury brand in 1903. The brand was almost an immediate success and quickly developed a reputation for excellence in the automotive community because of their design and engineering. And of course, they didn't sell to black people. Cadillac was General Motors' top of the line and most expensive product, but the company had an unwritten rule of not selling its cars to black customers. But the Great Depression started to devastate the automotive market. Luxury manufacturers such as Cadillac faced a substantial decline in sales. In 1928, General Motors produced 1,700,000 vehicles, with 41,000 of them being Cadillacs. But by 1933, the production had dropped to just 780,000 vehicles, with only 7,000 of them being Cadillacs. That is the decline of 84%. And as the economy began to downturn, so did affluent white consumers. GM's executive committee would gather together in a meeting to make a decision on the future of the Cadillac division who was losing so much money that they had plans to close the division down. Unexpectedly, Nicholas Drysdale, who was uninvited and in charge of GM's service department nationwide, knocked on the door and asked if he could just be heard for 10 minutes. The executive committee granted his request. Drysdale stated that he had a plan to make Cadillac profitable in 18 months. While traveling around the country and visiting different service departments, he had observed a significant number of African Americans in the service department at Cadillac dealership. They were members of the small African American elite, boxers, entertainers, lawyers, doctors, and ministers, but they were not allowed to buy a new car in the showroom. Drysdale found out that blacks were paying white front men $300 to purchase the cars for them. 
He asked the question, why should these men get several hundred dollars to profit that should go to General Motors? So he proposed a radical idea to target the African-American elite by marking a special Cadillac for them. He believed that to be an important step towards Cadillac becoming a profitable business. By targeting the African-American elite, he could increase their presence in the luxury market and build a relationship with a new customer base. Dryson urged the executive committee to go after the African-American market or at least allow them to come into the showroom. GM would accept Drysdale's suggestion and he would play a major role in the increased sales of Cadillac during the 1930s. While the Great Depression was still in full swing, in 1934, Cadillac sales rose 70%, leading to GM to sell enough vehicles to make the Cadillac division break even that year. Furthermore, from 1933 to 1941, sales increased from 6,000 units to 66,000 units. That is an increase of almost tenfold. So on June 10th of 1934, Drysdale was promoted to general manager of the Cadillac division. Now, Drysdale's initiative ending their racist sales policy in the 1930s apparently did not carry over to Cadillac's marketing division. The division wanted dealers to stop turning away black customers, but it did very little to actually attract them. With the resurgence of the economy in a post-World War II era, Cadillac's print and television advertisements during that period continued to define excellence as white. This exclusionary advertising would extend all the way to the 1970s, with Cadillac portraying a world of glamour and excellence that only comprised the white people. But Cadillac wasn't the only one. Because most automotive manufacturers during that time had advertisements that were completely white during the same time period. Additionally, individual car dealers maintained a significant degree of control over their showroom. According to a renowned automotive journalist, Warren Brown, his mother was unsuccessful in her attempt to purchase a new Cadillac from a dealership in New Orleans in the 1960s. However, she would ultimately be able to acquire her desired car, a 1965 Coupe de Ville, from a white man in a different location. Cadillac's diversity in marketing division served as a model for other divisions of General Motors and other automotive companies. This trend was primarily motivated by money more than morality. So that's how Cadillac became the first luxury car brand to intentionally market to black consumers. And in this case, Cadillac's acknowledgement literally saved them from bankruptcy. Martin Luther King used to carry a weapon and even apply for a concealed handgun permit. In January of 1956, after his house was firebombed, Dr. Martin Luther King applied to the local sheriff for a concealed handgun permit. However, he was denied on the grounds that he was deemed unsuitable. Family members and friends were concerned for King's safety and urged him to hire a bodyguard or at least an armed watchman. But after a meeting with Bayard Rustin to show his support for the Montgomery bus boycott, the meeting would forever change King and the civil rights movement. King had read the philosophy of pacifism, but he had not yet embraced it into his life. When Bayard Rustin arrived in Montgomery, Dr. King and Coretta owned a gun, but B.R. Rustin's influence encouraged them to reconsider and accept pacifism as a way of life. King came to the realization that it would be hypocritical for him to carry a weapon even for his own protection, stating, how could I serve as a leader of a nonviolent movement and at the same time use a weapon of violence for my own protection? Have you ever wondered why the civil rights movement wore their Sunday best? or why the Black Panthers wore leather jackets. Well, these iconic images of past protests demonstrate that dress can make a political statement. Black people chose the styles that they wear in order to influence public opinion on racial injustice. Through fashion, they were able to express their views and send a powerful message to the American public. During the mid-50s and early 60s, Black people in America fought against injustice and inequality, including racial segregation and disenfranchisement. In an effort to combat racial stereotypes like the idea that black people were lazy, inept, poor, or primitive, that further discrimination against them, and some leaders of the civil rights movement upheld nonviolent protest methods, including sit-ins and freedom rides and bus boycotts and marches. These methods were intended to dignify the movement and humanize the thousands of participants across America fighting to be fully integrated into a system in which they had been denied. And fashion played a big role in communicating that. 
and those in the fight needed to send a message. And that was a message of respectability. One that was intended to elevate the black community in the eyes of the greater public. A sharply dressed, modest black body worked as a tool in conjunction with the passive efforts of the nonviolent protests. Women who participated in the movement wore neatly pressed hair, cardigans, button ups, and stockings under their skirts with modest hemlines. Men did the same, marching in dark colored suits that were overstarched, white undershirts, and ties. Black Americans were considered to be the bottom of the social hierarchy, so it meant a great deal they would challenge that vision by wearing the Sunday best. These aesthetics of this period spoke to being non-threatening at a time when a black man could just as easily be beaten or jailed for their mere existence. These smartly attired leaders helped usher in major legislative victories like the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Denim also played an important part in the civil rights movement. In the rural southern United States, denim overalls and jeans were traditionally seen as clothing of black sharecroppers, and the black middle class wanted to distance themselves from this image. But the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee reclaimed denim workwear to show solidarity with the working class and to make a powerful statement about class and respectability. Denim was also more suitable for these student activists than dresses and suits. During the late 60s, though, a new kind of politics and style emerged among the younger generation of the black community, desiring to take more immediate action and demonstrate a more powerful leadership than their predecessors. The Black Panther Party was formed. This party was the complete opposite of the current civil rights movement, advocating for black power and self-defense, instead, as they called it, politely asking for their civil rights. Their uniform embodied this new attitude. Up to that point, black nationalist groups had adapted many acts of their cultural garb from Africa, like wearing head wraps and arc necklaces. But founders of the Black Panther Party, Huey P. Newton and Bobby Seale, opposed this aesthetic because it's opportunistic cultural practitioners operating as front men to further the exploitation of black people and impede the real revolutionary struggle. The Black Panther uniform consisted of leather jackets, plaid blue shirts, black pants, shoes, gloves, and the famous black beret which was picked up after Newton and Seale had watched a movie on the French resistance to the Nazis during World War II. They felt that it was a strong symbol of militancy, and this was the militancy that they wished the Black Panthers to convey. In the same way that civil rights leaders had dressed to convey an image of respectability to white people's preconceived notions of black people, the Black Panthers dressed the way to send a message of black pride and liberation. Also, the color black during the Panther era was reclaimed as a source of power and pride. They would refute the idea of black being bad, and this is when the mantra of black power and black is beautiful began to surface. That's when the natural hair movement got underway, with afros becoming a statement of their own. The rules dictating the look or behave a certain way or what was right were completely abandoned. In recent years, protest attire has gotten more casual. T-shirts with political messages have become the norm. During Occupy Wall Street in 2011, people showed up wearing jeans, T-shirts, hoodies, and shorts, making it easier to mobilize within their cities. During the Black Lives Matter movement, not only were T-shirts being worn during the protests, but they showed a variety of messages. The T-shirts worn usually would have statements like, I can't breathe, or the names and images of people who had died in state-sanctioned violence. Since the 1960s and well into the 70s, t-shirts have become a popular way and a fairly inexpensive medium to convey a message that could be mass produced and quickly circulated. Beyond being worn, they signaled a person's alignment with a particular movement. Even today, whether the messaging is obvious or nuanced, African Americans continue to protest against injustice, and no matter the decade, they continue to dress in a manner that conveys their political message to the American public. Webster's Dictionary defines the phrase mumbo jumbo as jargon or an otherwise confusing language. However, the phrase has a more interesting origin originating in Western Africa. In the 1700s, Francis Moore, a travel writer, documented the term mumbo jumbo in his book, Travels into the Interior of Africa. Moore describes mumbo jumbo as a masked dancer, which is involved in certain religious ceremonies. The Mandinka people were said to dress up in the character wearing a masquerade habit in order to resolve domestic disputes. While the exact origin of the word is uncertain, experts suggest that it derived from the word mamba jambu, which is derived from the Manic people. 
By the early 1800s, English speakers started to apply the African phrase and mixing it with anything that confused them. In the 1896 edition of Farmer and Henley's Slang and Other Analogies, Mumbo Jumbo is described as a grotesque idol supposedly worshipped by African people. It wasn't until the early 20th century where the meaning of mumbo jumbo began being divorced from its African origins and became what we know of today an unnecessarily involved or incomprehensible language. In 1906, crowds gathered at the Monkey House exhibit at the Bronx Zoo. They were there to see evolutionary ancestors, which consisted of monkeys, chimpanzees, a gorilla, an orangutan, and an African man of short stature. His name was Otabinga. Otabinga was brought to the United States in 1904 by explorer Samuel Werner and had previously been featured in an exhibit of pygmies in 1904's St. Louis World Fair. Otabinga was born in 1881 and was only four foot 11 and 103 pounds. Although he was referred to as a boy, he had been married twice. At the time, the Bronx Zoo was under the direction of Dr. William Hornsday, who had eccentric views on animals having human thoughts and personalities. Hornsday placed O in a cage at the zoo, claiming that he was an intriguing exhibit. The exhibit was immensely popular and controversial. Of course, the black community was extremely outraged, and some church members feared that it would convince people of Darwin's theory of evolution. Under threat of legal action, Hornsday had Binga leave the cage and circulate around the zoo in a white suit, but he would have to return to the monkey house to sleep at night. Otabinga hated being the object of curiosity. 40,000 visitors a day crowded to the monkey house to see him, and shouted and poked at him. At one point, he got a hold of a knife and began brandishing it at visitors at the park. Another time, he made a bow and arrow and started shooting them at visitors. After this point, he was forced to leave the park, and after his park experiences, several institutions tried to help him out. He was placed in Virginia Theological Seminary in college, but quit to go work in a tobacco factory. Soon, he grew homesick, hostile, and despondent. He borrowed a revolver and unalived himself in 1916. Thank you. I'm your host, Country Boy, and this has been One Mike History. And if you have questions or you just want to leave your comments, like I said, you can do so at onemikehistory.com in the contact page. Thank you for listening and peace.